Uh, as Ned said, I, I recently was at uh, out to the Microsoft at BP Summit, which they hold once a year. And they bring in, they ask all the MVPs around the world to come. Uh, there's never more than 3,500 of us at any given time. Uh, so this year we had 2,300 that actually came from uh, 90 countries uh, to, the, to the MVP Summit. And at the summit, they, they share a lot of things with us, many of the things we can't discuss for India. But there's something, you know, what I can do is kind of give you the overall impression of not just where Microsoft's going, but where the technology overall is going. And as the slide shows up here, you know, over the last, of course, the last 20 years, and many of you have been involved in that, directly and deeply involved in that. And everything that everybody does, from desktop support to server management to network management administration, to project management to program management, it all has something to do with advancing the technology in the ecosystem. So everybody here that works in technology has something to do with that. So I got reflective on that when I was at Microsoft. And I thought, you know, I've been in computers since 1979. And I have used some of these early computers. Many of you have. You know, I was a developer, a DBA, a network admin. You know, now I'm a program manager. So all the things that, of IT that all of you do, I have done as well. And so we've all had a, a hand in this. And this, this technology we have is about to explode. It really is. And so tonight what I want to talk about is where that technology is going, where we are, and where we've been. So all of this, I say here, have made enormous gains. So the critical components that will be involved in our next evolution in technology are these. Artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and the devices. Those are the ones that are going to carry us forward. And what we've seen in the past, the traditional managing of networks, uh, working on servers, desktop support, these kind of things, are going to change dramatically over the next 10 to 20 years. And I want to talk about how they're going to change and where you can find yourself and get yourself ready for those changes that are coming that are upon us. First, I'm going to talk about is artificial intelligence. Now, I've got a lot of videos in this because they explain to you better, much better than I could, what we're going to be looking at. So, we'll start that first. This is from a movie called Ex Machina. If you have not seen it, I highly recommend that you do. Uh, no, this 
for the technological, the technological singularity. That's the point where artificial intelligence and machines reach the level of human understanding from the standpoint of being able to worry about their self-preservation. What am I going to do? You know, I'm not going to walk out in traffic because I'm not going to be killed. But the machine doesn't have that capability other than being able to have some sensors to block things. But having the ability to make the decision, I'm not going to do that because it will harm me. The thought of me is where the singularity is. We're a long way from that. But we are approaching it. We're working for it gradually and then naturally. Excellent. The evolution of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, they really look at it in two seasons, spring and winter. Spring is when a lot of interest happens in artificial intelligence. It can be spurred by movies, it can be spurred by advances in the technology, any number of things. At that time, you see a lot more corporate investment a lot more interest in the scientific community and research. In the winter, for whatever reason, it tends to slow down. Interest falls off. Investment falls off. We're now, right now, at this point in time, we are at the most active, productive spring in the history of artificial intelligence. The U.S. leads the world right now in artificial intelligence research and development. But Japan and China are coming on like freight trains. They are working very hard with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has all manner of potential benefits, and we'll go into those a little bit more later on. You're not spinning my globe. Do I? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay, here's some of the areas of artificial intelligence that you guys might want to look at data mining, robotics, and developer activities, writing code for this, because everything that drives it is actually the code underneath it. The information that drives it and supports it is the data mining, the huge databases, basically, the super data, big data, we call it. That's all about gathering tremendous amounts of information. If you look at what Google and other companies are doing in self-driving cars, you know, I read an article about BMWs beginning to work on their self-driving car. They have to have something like 300,000 miles of testing to gather enough data to give that computer enough information to make decisions. 300,000 miles. Just initially, for the first phase. And then they have to go through four phases after that. There's five levels. So we're looking at one and a half million miles for that computer to be able to begin to make rudimentary decisions. So that the amount of data has to be voluminous extremely large in order for the computer to make decisions. Think of how many decisions you make every day and how much data you gather throughout the course of your life where you are right now to make those decisions. It's enormous. And the human brain can make calculations by the millions in a very, very short time. So they're trying to build the computers to have that ability, but it's going to take a while. But we've made enormous strides at this point. By far the greatest danger of artificial intelligence is that people conclude too early that they understand it. <clears throat> we don't understand it yet, but we're closer than we were yesterday and we'll be closer tomorrow than we are today. Next. Programming, data mining, robotics, as I said. And here are three guys that are arguably very important in the world. One in particular, I wanted to get his thoughts on artificial intelligence. Go ahead and start with I'm working on artificial intelligence and taking a look at some of these things. What do you think is interesting in this arena? Where do you think we run into potential problems? Because you've also said that you think it could be a, a, a real issue for humanity if things get out of control. Well, in the even 10 to 20 year time frame, uh, artificial intelligence is going to be extremely helpful. And, it, and the risk that it gets super smart, that's way out in the future and uh, probably we're talking about. But now what we're seeing is that for the first time, computers can see as well as humans. 
that's pretty incredible. If you combine that with the ability to have arm-like manipulation, um, then they can make this far more productive, but then you know, the job market has to adjust to that. Uh, Google, uh, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft are all moving ahead at a great speed in improving this artificial intelligence software. So it's very exciting. And uh, the speed is, is faster than it was five years ago. Where, where would be the one area that you think stands to have the most promise for this? I mean, are you thinking the productivity in the labor force like you thought? Are you thinking driverless cars? Are you thinking advances in health and technology or health and science? Where, where, where would you think the real, uh, real promise lies? Well, one area is, is what we call agents, where if you're seeking knowledge, you can talk in natural language to an expert agent and it will do as well as a human would give you information. A specific example of that is have the software help you uh, figure out what's important. Today we're kind of slaves to our computer where we have to decide to go to email or Twitter or text and uh, we're the one weighing which might be more important. Software is going to solve that, where it will look at all the new information and present to you, knowing it about your interests, what would be most valuable. So making this more efficient, the, uh, what I call the alter ego software, uh, will be a, a huge help. Hey, CNBC fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Here you're going to find videos packed with all of the information that you... <coughs> so, what Mr. Gates is, is talking about is the helpfulness of AI how AI becomes a tool for an agent. How many of you have uh, an Echo Dot or an Amazon Echo? A couple of you. I got one as a gift, I got a Dot, and just started playing around with it. That thing is incredible. You know, it turns on the lights in my house. It turns off the lights when I tell it to. It sets the temperature of my, my furnace and my air conditioning to what I want it to be. Uh, it will give me information, it will tell me a joke, it will play music, any kind of music I want at any given time. It will tell me the weather, and all I have to say is, Alexa, what's the weather today? And she'll tell me what the temperature is right now, what the weather's going to be. Alexa, what, are, what is my schedule today? And she'll read it off for me. Alexa, what is the traffic like on the way to work? She'll tell me. What time should I leave to get to work? She'll tell me. That's an incredible bit of software, and it's artificial intelligence of what we have right now. So if you don't have an Amazon dot or something like it, Google just came out or something, I encourage you to look into it because they are absolutely amazing. Now, I'm going to show you a video here that's pretty amazing. And I actually petitioned Microsoft to let me use this technology so that I could present this, uh, this presentation to you while I was at my house. So you would be able to see me, but I would be a hologram. It really exists today, and he's going to demonstrate it. Go ahead, Jose. Hi, today we're going to show you an exciting new technology that could fundamentally change the way that people will communicate in the future. Imagine being able to virtually teleport from one space to another in real time. Hey Sergio, um, how does it feel like to be holoported? It feels great to be holoported. So Sergio is to wear his HoloLens device, and I'm going to wear mine. We can see each other in full 3D in real time. We can interact and communicate as if we're co-present. Sergio, can you walk around my space? Can you walk around this chair? So we're doing everything to get the impression that Sergio and I are present in the same space. Sergio, let's just do a high five. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Sergio. We call this technology holoportation. Now, to make all this happen, we've had to create a new type of 3D capture technology. I'm surrounded by these 3D cameras that we've developed in our team. Each of them is capturing me from a separate viewpoint, and we're fusing this data together to create a temporally consistent model, as you can see reconstructed live behind me. Now, the camera that's filming me has a whole lens tracking system attached, and this allows us to take these 3D models and composite them in real time into the real world, as you can see here. And that gives you a sense of the fidelity of the reconstructions that we can achieve. Once we have these reconstructions, we can texture them, 
We can then compress the data and transmit the data over to the other side. Over on the other side, a user wearing a HoloLens can see these remote participants live in their space as if they're co-present. And that's what we're showing you picture in picture. Now imagine using this type of capture technology to connect with family members who are thousands of miles away. And that's exactly what we're going to demonstrate to you right now. My daughter is stood in a similar capture rig <coughs> somewhere else in our lab. And she's going to hotport into my space, and I'm going to interact with her wearing my HoloLens. Hi, Baba, I miss you. Hey, Lydia, I miss you too. Are you coming home? I'm coming home very soon. Let me get out of your way. Hey, Lydia, you can only hear me, you can't see me, but what are these toys? I have toys to show you. This one is named Elmo. Elmo? You can sing. Wow. <coughs> and what about the other one? The other one is called Tina, and I like it because it has different stuff. Well, that's so cool. So, Lydia, can you climb up on this chair that's behind you? Okay. Yeah, climb up. Be very careful. Now, I'm going to count to three, and I want you to jump. One, two, three, jump! <laughs> that was so cool. <coughs> oh, let me get out of your way again. I like you so much. I love you too. I'm soon. I'll be home very soon. Bye bye. Now, in that example, we were demonstrating live 3D capture, but our system is capable of another thing. We can actually record and play back that entire session. Now this is almost like reversing through time. And if I wear my HoloLens device, it's almost like walking into a living memory that I can see through another pair of eyes from all these different perspectives. And because this is 3D content, we can miniaturize it onto this coffee table and experience it in a more convenient manner. And this becomes a magical way of experiencing <coughs> these live captured memories. Now imagine being able to teleport to any place with anyone at any time. And that's what holoportation is all about. Thank you for watching. <coughs>
She said, okay. She captured it, shrunk it down, put it on the table, just like he did, and you can see it. It was amazingly incredible. But I've seen this stuff work. It, is, it actually exists. This is not vaporware. This stuff exists. The computer-generated simulation of a three-dimensional image or environment can be, that can be interacted with in a seemingly real or physical way by a person using special electronic equipment. How many of you have a virtual reality device? One, two. I have a, a Samsung phone, and so I sprung for the VR gear. Amazing. You put the phone in there, you put the thing on, it takes off. You're suddenly in a completely new world. You can, you've got headphones on, you can hear everything. Music, rain, thunder, lightning. Driving a car, riding a roller coaster. You actually get dizzy. I recommend you sit down because you'll fall over. How many of you have gone to the Microsoft store and experienced the VR uh, demo that they had? I recommend all of you do that. It is absolutely incredible. That's the Oculus Rift that they use there. And you have a hand control where you're actually making things happen. It's truly amazing. The big one, though, is the HoloLens. The HoloLens, I can see you right now. If you put on the other VR glasses, your vision's blocked. With the, the VR gear, I know that you have an option where you can see through it, just if you need to talk to somebody. My, my wife doesn't believe I can see her when I've got that, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but to be able to try that and experience it is a pretty good idea. How is that going to impact the IT world? Well, you know, there are, there are companies and universities right now that have virtual reality tours of their campus, buildings, the campus, all different areas. So with the HoloLens and virtual reality, you could actually visit a remote site and advise somebody there how to fix the server, how to fix their PCs. You are there. You can actually be there in a Skype call. You can have a Skype stream up on the wall. Nobody can see you but the person with the HoloLens at the place you're, you're projecting to, and they can see you. And you can see what they're doing and guide them on how to fix whatever problem is. Or you can physically be there through a holographic image, not physical. So you see some of the implications here, from meetings to uh, resolving issues and problems to actually being someplace, to be able to affect the outcome of something that needs to happen somewhere where it's remotely where you couldn't ordinarily be. But how many of you tried to troubleshoot something on the phone with somebody that's not really familiar? And how frustrating that can be. It is wild because, you know, it's great if you can take over remotely on the PC, but you're still limited. You can't really help them. But if you, imagine if you could be there and see what they're doing 4,000 miles away and guide them through and they could see you, facial expressions and so forth. You could really accomplish much more and more quickly and certainly more economic. So you see where this is going. This is exploding. This is happening. This is going on. Here's the evolution of virtual reality. You know, our first one in 1930, we've had virtual reality in this world since 1930, with the first link trainer to help pilots learn how to fly. <coughs> then we have saw your viewmaster. How many of you use viewmasters? You're telling yourself. <laughs> it's since wrong. I have a 3D immersive theater chair cabinet. You sat down and put your face up. I remember being as a boy seeing one of these. Put your face up, and it was wow, it was like a big viewmaster. Same technology. That was your mask. They took the viewmaster and mounted it to your head. That was really the only difference. Uh, the Astra movie map was a product that was not around very long, but what it did was give you a virtual tour of Aspen, Colorado. VPL icon, another immersive headset. This time they added a glove where you could actually interact with the environment. Nintendo Virtual Boy, how many people remember that? That thing lasted about nine months and then just kind of went away. The, the virtual gaming machines, they sold for $78,000 for one of them. And they weren't very good. They couldn't even begin to touch what we had. Microsoft Connect, how many of you got Connect? Yeah, a lot of us. Uh, although my uh, my particular uh, one is dumb as a rock, I have to yell at her over and over. 
Huh. Uh, iPhone VR viewer, Oculus Rift, Google Cardboard, Samsung Gear VR, and Marcel Holiday. So from 1930 to 2016, we've had VR with us for a long time. Next. Now touch my, my globe. Where's my globe? Yeah, I like my globe spin. All right, here's the top companies in VR. Microsoft, Lee, Sony, Samsung, and there are several corporations that are working together now in a consortium to really push the technology forward. Because VR, as they're looking at $100 billion for the next couple of years, it is, it is exploding everywhere. You're going to really see it coming on strong in the next five years. And that's what this presentation is all about. Where are we going? Next one. And here's some of the impacts that you can make and you might want to think about in virtual reality. Code development, big time. Huge opportunities in code development. Uh, the really top level VR code developers over the next five, ten years will be pulled down serious dollars. Serious dollars. Uh, device development and troubleshooting. As we develop these VR devices, they're going to break. They're going to have problems. We're going to have tech support necessary, absolutely. VR utilization for hardware support I talked about a while ago. So become familiar with it. Immerse yourself in it. Don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. Because this is the way the world's evolved. As the Internet of Things advances, the very notion of a clear dividing line between reality and virtual reality becomes blurred, sometimes in very creative ways. Yes? What, what, what would you consider device development troubleshooting? The what? <clears throat> what would you consider device development and troubleshooting? Is that like robotics or hardware? Or? Both. Both. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about robotics because we're going to talk talk about wearable tech. Uh, so robotics is going to be huge. And there are some robots out there now, I'll get to you in a second, there are some robots out there now that are just blowing you away. The Japanese have done some amazing things. Honda has a robot that will run back and forth or serve you tea, it'll crack open an egg, it'll talk to you. They actually are using these things at, at Honda headquarters. When you go into Honda headquarters and you go in the door, there's a robot standing there about this tall. And he will recognize you by your face if you're in the database. If not, he'll ask you who you are, who you're there to see. And if he's expecting you, if you, if you have a calendar agenda, he'll say, Mr. Smith, we're waiting for you. So-and-so, the person you're going to be seeing named Tommy Shara, uh, is waiting for you. Will you follow me, please? And he'll lead you there, knock on the door, ask Mr. Tommy Shara, are you ready to see your 9 o'clock? He said, you can go in. That's a robot. That's an artificial intelligence Android robot. Yeah, and they also have human-looking androids that you show two people next to each other, the android and the human. It's hard to tell them apart. They have the same mannerisms. They blink their eyes the same way. They move their mouth the same way. They'll tilt their head the same way when they're talking to you. And they will speak to you in this almost exactly the same voice that the human sit next to them, the ones they plump. Okay. That's happening right now. They're using them in museums in Japan to give information and, and provide tours. Did you see that lady who was sitting in the passenger seat of that car and real because she was frozen? They broke the car window and found out she was just a, a dummy for, for demonstration purposes for some medical sales yeah. this time. So I was in the paper just... You know, you bring up a good point that I haven't touched on. In the medical, medical field, the use of virtual reality all the teleportation, uh, all of these things, robotics, are going to be hugely involved in all the medical industry. They may be a little later to adopt it because traditionally they have been, but once they do, look out. It will go wild. Yes, sir. I was going to say, now, I've never developed anything for Microsoft, but somehow I'm considered a Microsoft developer. So and I imagine probably there's quite a few in this room that are. If you are, the, the HoloLens is available to Microsoft developers developers for three thousand dollars so that is a lot yeah, of money now, but you know it, 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 it is not March what's that it's March. March okay it's March right yeah maybe have it's three thousand dollars that after the uh, all in for your kid which includes a holiday but I'll tell you you ever put one of these things on let's talk about the future of virtual reality we're going to see 
a uh, little video here, a short video, with the CEO of Oculus. So I'm here with Paul Lucky of Oculus, and tell me, how has these last few months been since sort of the, uh, the final build of the Oculus Fit? So everything's going really well. Uh, we're going to be launching the Rift at, at the end of March. Uh, we launched Gear VR together with Samsung on Black Friday just a few months ago. So uh, we're having a really good time. We're finalizing all of our content, finalizing all our hardware, getting ready to ship all of this stuff. This is great, and I just experienced uh, Minecraft with Oculus, with, with, with the Rift, and I gotta say it was really great, so congratulations. Thank you, I'm glad you thought so. The, the, the Minecraft team has done a lot of work to make it into a good VR experience. On the performance side, UI side, it, it, they've done a really good job of making it feel like it's a real made-for VR application. Yeah, and uh, now we're here at a Microsoft event. Is there anything to say about things coming up with Microsoft? It seems like Oculus is, really likes Microsoft. So we talked a lot about them a lot in the past. Uh, like we're bundling the Xbox One gamepad with the Rift. Uh, we've announced that Minecraft is going to be on Gear VR and on Rift. Uh, we've shown off Xbox One streaming. We're able to stream Xbox One games into a virtual theater. Um, I can't talk about anything that we're going to be announcing in the future. It's better if you talk to Microsoft. No problem. But hey, there, it sounds like there might be something in the future, which is really exciting. We're going to keep working together. What do you see in the future of VR heading? I mean, the, the future of VR in the long run is to have virtual reality technology that can present virtual worlds that are indistinguishable or close to indistinguishable from the real world. Once we can do that, VR isn't a technology that really can possibly fail. I mean, it's, it's something that is applicable to everybody, not just gamers, not just hardcore gamers. That's something that anybody can use. What, what hurdles do you see uh, that we need to accomplish before we can sort of get to that indistinguishable factor? So there's a lot of optics challenges, display challenges, sensor challenges, but one of the biggest challenges is going to be rendering horsepower. I mean, it's the same thing that's always been the limiting factor in the games industry. It's how many flops do we have to push these graphics? And obviously, we're not at the point right now where we have consumer viable devices that can push photorealistic graphics of every possible scenario, but we're getting close. We're getting, we're getting pretty close. Where do you, do you look at the competition ever? Of course. <laughs> any any uh, opinion? <laughs> I mean... I'm obviously biased. I think we have the best hardware. I think we have the best software. I think we have the best developers. I mean, I just, I just mostly, you know, I'm obviously really proud of what we've built, but it's good to see other people in the space because it really shows that VR is something that everybody believes in. You know, it's not just me and my company believing in it. That would actually be kind of scary if we're the only company that believed in VR. But because there's all this competition, it kind of justifies. It's like, hey, Lots of companies out there, from teeny tiny companies all the way up to multi-hundred billion dollar corporations, they all try VR and they see that it's an important thing and they start, you know, yeah. jumping into the industry. And when, you, I mean, it seems like such a crazy ride. When when you started, it almost felt like everyone was saying this this couldn't exist, this couldn't happen. What is the biggest change that you've seen since that initial Kickstarter to where now we finally have the Rift? The biggest change has been kind of acceptance. Like, as people try it, like, when people try VR, they understand it and they believe in it. That, that's, that's a lot different from VR in the 80s and the 90s. Back then, VR was hyped up as this future technology that was going to change everything. But the people who tried VR back then were actually the ones who were least excited about it because they saw the limitations. They realized how far away it really was. Now it's the opposite. People who try the Rift almost always come away believing that even if they don't want to buy a rip right now, they understand VR, and they understand that they are going to want to use it at some point. What do you think the next step is to, you know, we have the product, what do you think the next step is for acceptance? To get that person who thinks, yeah, this is, I see that this experience is it. Now, what do you think they need to do to actually buy one and use it all the time? Three big things. One, a broader content library. We already have a lot of stuff to play, but there is a huge content library that's going to be coming out, not just at launch, but over the next year and the year after that. And that's really important because there needs to be new stuff coming out, and you need to be broadening that audience of your broadening the audience by making things that everybody wants to do. Not just gamers, not just hardcore gamers, but also having more genres of games come out. The two other things you need to do are drive up the quality, drive down the cost. If you had a virtual reality headset that cost $100 that was as good as real life, I don't think there's a person in the world who wouldn't be at least a little bit interested in that. That's great. Thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you. Thank you. The future is bright. Thank you so much. One thing I had to talk about is virtual reality relative to gaming. I have Minecraft in virtual reality. 
is the one of the few that actually uses an Xbox controller. And while you're in there, not only you're seeing everything, you're actually moving around within that environment. You can look behind you, above you, below you. You've got things coming at you all over. You have to be aware of everywhere you are. Very simple kind of fundamental game. But imagine what it's like with Halo. Imagine if you're, how many of you play Halo? Most of us. Imagine if you were actually in the environment. As, a, as an MVP, I've been given the privilege of seeing the research and development areas or layouts of some of the companies, not just Microsoft, but others, where they're actually developing things to augment the reality even more. One thing I, I saw that I really struck me is, okay, how do you move around? How do you walk around? There's a couple of ways to work on that. They have a treadmill that goes forward, back, and sideways. So whichever way you're turning, the treadmill is working with you. So you're actually standing in one place. But in the virtual world, you're running or you're walking or you're turning, stopping, and turning. And the, the, uh, the space that you're occupying is activate, activating to your movements and working with you. The one that I think has the most promise looks like a bowl. And it has treads this way. And you're actually wearing a harness that keeps you from falling down. Because you lose your bearings in virtual reality very quickly. But as you move, it moves. So you never move from that spot. But you think you've gone 100 miles. And everything around you is reacting to it. And some of them have smells. This one, particular one, has smells, air. So when the wind is blowing in from the ocean, you're feeling it here and you're smelling the salt. Absolutely amazing. You are there. You are there. I can see addiction happening, happening very quickly with these devices because people would like to escape, to get away from the stresses of the day. Oh, my Lord. You don't ever want to come out. It's like being in the best dream you've ever been or the worst nightmare. There you are. So gaming and virtual reality is really, gaming is what's going to drive it the fastest. Next. Oh, this is now let's talk about computers. Google purchased something called a quantum computer in 2013. Two years later, after extensive testing here at the end of 2015, they are claiming that it works and is capable of using quantum physics to solve math much faster than a regular computer. In fact, a hundred million times faster. And if everything they're representing is true, that's great. But it's truly very hard to say, as a legitimate understanding of quantum computing is not mainstream at this point. And I don't know about you, but when I hear a computer that's a hundred million times faster than current computers, I think, what can it do for gaming? And today, Gamex wants to explore what may be possible for gamers thanks to quantum computing. So to start, computers today, mainstream, personal computers, supercomputers, and really any kind of computer that you use today, from the most powerful research-based laboratory computer down to that calculator you use, all work in binary. That is ones and zeros, on and off, true and false, yes and no. And that's it. Every complex operation runs off a very long series of yes or no questions. That means everything from the simplest calculator program to the smoothest, most optimized, graphic-intense, triple-A gaming experiences. And yes, when you send instructions to the GPU, the graphical processing unit, it handles everything that exact same way. And quantum computing doesn't. Quantum computing uses tiny bits of information called qubits, which is essentially a two-state quantum mechanical system that can be hard to even comprehend. It's on such a tiny scale that the human mind can't really grasp it from a physical standpoint. Our understanding of it is basically limited to the abstract. For instance, it can mean the polarization of a single photo and a photon is smaller than an atom, and an atom is something that you will never see even in a microscope because it's tiny. As I said, our understanding of this has to basically be abstract. Anyway, qubits can be both one and zero, true and false, at the same time. In order to get information out of a qubit-based system, qubits have to be manipulated in a certain sequence, but generally give much faster and more accurate results. For instance, if you're using a traditional computer and therefore ones and zeros, true and false, the computer would ask itself if the 
answer to something, say, if 10 was divisible by 5, by asking which numbers are divisible, returning a true or false answer, 1 or 0. Quantum computing doesn't have to check these things. It doesn't work by process of elimination, finding out what things you can get a yes answer to. Quantum computing is much more nonlinear, and because of that, it can arrive at a conclusion much faster because it bypasses a lot of the work. But at the same time, a bit is very predictable. Having on or off 1 or 0 is essentially saying it's going to be one of these two things and nothing else. A qubit arrives at the conclusion of yes or no if you finesse it a certain way, but it does not behave that way. A qubit can kind of be unpredictable and chaotic, and to apply quantum computing to video games, programming would have to work on a fundamentally different unit because at the very base of modern computing is the bit, and at the very base of quantum computing is the qubit. To compound that, it's very good at solving certain kinds of problems. Not all problems. Probably the most applicable to gaming is artificial intelligence. Fifty years from now, quantum computing can give us artificial intelligence that is marginally better than it is today. But is quantum computing going to be able to be used to make the graphics to games better, or make games faster, bring down load times, get rid of the uncanny valley? Really all of those things probably are not possible thanks to quantum computing. Computing, and will continue to develop over time on their own, but likely staying within the realm of traditional computing. Quantum computing is going to enhance the logic of games. As I said, that could mean much better artificial intelligence, but it could also mean much better physics. Physics could end up being significantly more complex and lifelike as the rigid nature of switches is removed in quantum computing. But it's not limited to physics and artificial intelligence. Admittedly, I am not a scientist, and I do not know everything about this subject. People who do are generally saying that we'll probably never actually see a quantum computer per se, but rather chips that contain components for quantum computing. These chips will handle all of the operations that quantum computing can handle much better, while everything that traditional computing handles better will be handled traditionally. I know obvious statement of the year is obvious. I wouldn't be shocked if graphics cards, for instance, contained a quantum chip that offloaded a lot of the AI or perhaps physics work to the quantum computing chip, and then left more visually oriented things like shaders to the traditional computing of the GPU. Now, if this is indeed the scenario, this would, in fact, enhance the graphical performance of games, not necessarily because it builds upon the graphical capabilities of a computer, but instead diverts more non-graphical work onto a specialized chip designed specifically for that, leaving the CPU and the GPU with more resources to do the typical magic that they do. So, bottom line, what can quantum computing do for gamers? Short answer, nothing glamorous but lots of good things. Anything that makes it easier for the computer to do more work faster is obviously a big thing. And the more things that they can figure out to offload to a quantum computing chip, the more resources you have to work with on your main, much more visible processes, specifically talking about the graphics. Indirectly, quantum computing could be the thing that makes it possible to finally get over the damn uncanny valley by ensuring as many systems as possible that aren't 100% graphically related are not being handled by any process or hardware that has to do with graphics. And while that may not be an explosion, sometimes the most important stuff isn't the flashiest. And I think when developers and hardware makers finally figure this out, we are going to be shocked with the results. Are you excited for the possibilities of what quantum computing could bring game in? Did this help you understand it at all better? To be entirely truthful, this isn't meant as a deep exploration of it, but... When he first started, he said something really caught my attention. What if your computer was a hundred million times faster than it is today? Not just faster, but a hundred million times. Now that starts, we're talking about in this presentation where we're going, what the future is. When we talked about virtual reality, we talked about artificial intelligence. A model computer has to fit into that. The number of calculations have to be much higher than what we have seen over the last 5, 10, 15 years. They are going to. Within the next 10 to 15 years, the experts are saying we will have quantum computers like we have laptops today, 100 million times faster than we have. And those computers with those massive, the massive power they have will be in that artificial intelligence, that Android. We saw an Android. It didn't look like an Android. There were two Androids in it. There was one Japanese and female. That was an Android. And I've seen the video of that particular Android having a conversation with someone and answering questions that were not 
free uh, program, there were off the cuff questions. And it made decisions to answer those questions and have facial expressions that it was delivered. Because he has a computer inside of it, makes millions of calculations per second. It will be the death of fantasy football or whatever. Sorry? It will be the death of fantasy football and things like that. The future's coming. We have to embrace it. We have to find out ways that we can embrace it and make it work for us. Uh, you know, we've all been through changes. We've all seen technology changes that have impacted us, some positively, some somewhat negatively. And, you know, there are there's a certain level of, of fright, of terror in technology that's moving so fast. You know, it used to be uh, a, a term we call future shock. And it happened about 15 years ago when suddenly we made what appeared to be the main populace a big jump in technology. We started doing things that we had only dreamed of before, and suddenly they were real. And it created a future shock, a feeling of inadequacy, fear. Well, we got over that. We moved past it. We embraced it. We learned how to make it work for us. So what I'm saying is don't let this new future that's coming down the road like a juggernaut scare you out. Find ways to adapt yourself to it and make it work for you. Now, let's take a look at what phones may look like over the next 10 or 15 years. And I think this is a pretty cool video, and I think it's going to be pretty close to what this show is. Yes, sir? Um, we have some standard words when we're looking at the future jobs, how we were so afraid of what technology, the internet, uh, communications, how fast we're going to be spreading. Uh, and yes, mostly we became kind of numb rather than adapted because now you start to see that all those fears actually are becoming reality when you see all the news when it comes to the NSA, with the big spies, when you see everything that is being tracked and recorded by Facebook, Google, your phone, and everything. So you actually were fears that became a reality because somehow we as a society became numb to it. Because we got so updated to the technology that we yeah. cannot be with. Right. So you know that everything, you know how deeply track are you with Facebook. Unfortunately, a lot of people cannot do that because of the main ways of communication. So rather than uh, yes, those fears don't come to reality, what happened is like we saw the reels, we adapted to it, and somehow we're living in a world where we are monitored by governments, companies, corporations that is grabbing all this information control and shape the future of how the planet is going to be, obviously, for their days somehow, and as a society is adjusting to that. Uh, now, when you see when it comes to uh, robotics, and that's sort of robotics, virtual technology, and uh, artificial intelligence, it's the same thing. It's yes, all those fears that are going to come, how are we going to adapt to all those things when they become a reality, rather than like, oh, it's going to happen. You know it's just going to happen. This is how we want as a society, as a society to adapt to those changes. There are two words in your narrative that really caught my attention. One is adaptive, yes. uh, and the other is control. Adaptive is our ability to understand and embrace what it is we are working with and what is coming for us. You know, remember the quote I had up there is that the, one of the greatest problems with, with, virtual, with artificial intelligence is we assume we understand it, but we don't. So adaptability also carries with it the uh, responsibility to become knowledgeable, to learn. Now, the society has adapted. I don't think they've gotten as so much numb as they've adapted. That's the word you used to call my attention. The other word you, you used was control. Uh, there have been entities that use technology to control things. However, as the technology evolves, we get many, many more tools to provide us with the information to make intelligent decisions. Along with that, as I said earlier, comes the responsibility of the individual to take that knowledge and make a difference. Now, if you want to lay down and let a truck run over you, he will. But if you want to take the knowledge and step out of the way, or get in the truck and drive it yourself, that's available to you. Well, the technology that's coming is going to provide you with an enormous number of choices to adapt. So that's why I'm saying Learn to adapt. Know that it's coming. Don't be intimidated. Embrace it. Find ways to make it work for you. Let's look at phones. What we think phones are going to look like in the next 10 years. 
Hi, welcome to another Cold Fusion video. To go back here. Today, the smartphone is an integral part of the lives of many people around the world. We are at the start of a technological revolution. A revolution so rapid in advancement and universal adoption that nothing like it has ever been seen on the face of this earth. And I think by the end of this production, you might agree. Mobile technology is the world's fastest growing industry after all. But with growth this fast, the question must be asked, are things starting to get a bit stagnant? In some markets, the answer is leaning towards yes. For example, in the United States, smartphone market penetration went from a mere 18% in the year 2010 to 72% just four years later in 2014. So we're running out of headroom here. The market may be beginning to saturate, but that doesn't mean the industry isn't going to innovate. I actually think the smartphone industry is just getting warmed up, and many innovations await us. So the big question is, where is this all going, and what is there in store for the future? Well, let's answer that today and take a look at what the future may hold. This video will be broken up into three parts in regards to the future of the smartphone. Form, function, and performance. Okay, so let's begin. Form. I remember in the early 2010s when people were talking about flexible phones that could change their shape depending on what you wanted to use it for. Although it's nice to dream, the reality is a phone is one of the most complex mass-produced consumer products in history. A typical phone includes highly integrated circuits, a wide array of sensors and processors, and not to mention the battery that would explode if you were to puncture it. For a phone that changes shape to happen, the manufacturing methods of internals would have to be radically and fundamentally changed. Until then, a truly free-form phone is still a pipe dream, albeit a very nice one. That being said, I do see curved screens like that on the Galaxy S6 Edge, or at least 2.5D screens like that on the iPhone 6 and original Note 4, as becoming more commonplace. Really, it's just a natural feeling for our fingers and allows for extra functionality, which is always good for software designers to stretch their creativity. I also think that front-facing speakers like that on the HTC M series make perfect sense on large screen phone tablets, and as the form factor finds its groove as a personal entertainment device, we could be seeing more front-facing speakers in the future. Okay, so those are the basics of form. What about something revolutionary and exciting? Enter modular designs. So this is the premise. If phones are becoming, or already are, mini computers, why not just have swappable parts like their desktop forefathers? Initiatives like PhoneBlocks and Project Ara by Google plan to do just this. Instead of buying a brand new phone every time you need to upgrade a component, now all you'd have to do is just slot in a new module for that part. For example, if your camera needs upgrading, just slot in a new one. If your screen breaks, slot in another one. If you need more RAM or a faster processor, no problem. If phone prices stay elevated as they are now and phone product life cycles stay at about one year, modular phones may gain some market share in the next five to ten years. All right, so let's move on to the next section. Function. This area has huge potential. Right now, today, your phones can be used for almost any casual task, but the phones of the future will be encompassing your entire digital life. Anything from social media presence, to payment, to even your driver's license. With the aid of cloud computing and machine learning, the healthcare industry will also be impacted by giving more control to the patients. The Wall Street Journal did a report on the future of healthcare through mobile technology. In this report, a working example of the future was given by cardiologist Eric Topol and goes as follows. I quote, Let's say you have a rash that you need examined. You can snap a picture of it with your smartphone and download an app to process the image. Within minutes, a dedicated computer algorithm can text to you your diagnosis. The message could include next steps such as recommending a topical ointment or a visit to a dermatologist for further assessment. He goes on to say that smartphone users will be able to perform physical exams on themselves. Apps are already being developed to handle all aspects of the eye, the throat and oral cavity, and the lungs and heart. He goes on to say that in the next 10 years, nanotechnology in the bloodstream could allow for phones to constantly monitor all of our organs for something like the very early signs of cancer. So that's a pretty interesting concept to think about. Alright, so let's move on a bit. Let's talk about mobile virtual reality. 
I'm predicting that this is going to be huge in the future with an entire spin-off industry just for this niche. Mobile VR totally makes sense in a serendipitous way. Since there are already no wires, as compared to today's early VR PC methods, all you would really need is a wireless gaming controller, and you could probably get a somewhat immersive experience anywhere, anytime. Although mobile VR games will probably be simpler than the PC counterparts, there's still plenty of potential here. So that's pretty cool, but what about the future of mobile software? As it turns out, within the mobile industry, the flow of capital is already slowly starting to go from the hardware into the software development. So with more money, we're bound to get better apps for a wider reach of users. More advanced applications are a great thing, but at the end of the day, these apps have to run on an operating system. And I think many of you would agree that there's still a lot of room for improvement there. Of course, sure. Android 5.0 and iOS 8 are pretty great, but they're kind of basic when you compare them to Mac OS or Windows 10, and even basic when you compare them to what smartphones might require in the future. In my opinion, in the future, I think we'll start to see mobile software that supports full desktop working environments, with integrated support for a keyboard, mouse, and external desktop monitor. All your work and data will be sent to the cloud, so the main idea is that you can get your work done anywhere, anytime, with absolutely no restrictions. This idea of the PC and phone coming together may sound familiar to some of you out there, and that's because it's been done before by Ubuntu. Ubuntu had the right vision with their mobile PC conversion software, but they had arrived way too early. The market still isn't ready, and neither is the consumer. Alright, so let's move on. In terms of battery life, today's battery life will be a joke. There are already numerous battery technologies that are on their way up, such as graphene and silicon energy storage, and organic batteries from companies such as Stortop. If these technologies don't get suppressed, we should be in for a treat in terms of longer lasting devices. We're talking 10 times the energy density and a battery life of weeks instead of a day or so. This can only happen if a free market environment exists that far in the future. Before we finish off this section, I just want to touch on one last thing, cameras. Phone cameras definitely have a lot of room for improvement, and I think in five years, they'll be much better than they are today. Perhaps 40 megapixels are standard, some pretty good depth of field, superior low light performance, and one thing that I think is gonna really increase is the capacity for high speed recording. I'm talking in the tens of thousands of frames here. And of course, super HD video recording like 6K and above. All right, so we're almost done. Let's move on to the last section. Performance. In previous videos, whenever I've talked about mobile performance and how it's doubling every year, and currently sits on a level of about a 2005 PC, it seems to cause a bit of controversy, even with hard numbers. But today, this concept goes a bit further with the Tegra X1, but we'll get to that in a second. First, a little bit of what could be coming. In terms of mobile power, I think that 2016 to 2017 will probably be the years of truly capable gaming mobile hardware. Today, we're already starting to see glimpses of that. Take the NVIDIA Tegra X1 as a case study. This so-called mobile superchip has 256 graphics cores, 8 processing cores, and can generate 4K video at 60Hz. Not to mention that it can run the cutting-edge game engines that today's PCs always run. Is that amazing, guys? Nice. Um, that was not a video. That was all run in real time. You were seeing Unreal Engine 4 running Elemental, the demo done by Epic. Everything was done in high dynamic range lighting, which basically means each one of the pixels, the RGB, are all floating. Exactly the same engine that runs on a high-end PC, exactly the same engine that runs in the next generation game console. Tegrex. Just two years ago, to perform feeds less than half as impressive took 300 watts of power. And today, with the X1, it just takes 10 watts. According to NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang, the Tegra X1 can run at one teraflop. Okay, so what you might be thinking. Well, let's put that into perspective. This is the supercomputer ASCI Red. It became fully operational in the year 1997 and was the first supercomputer to reach one teraflop. And it held that record till the year 2000. This computer took up a large room and required 10,000 Pentium Pros to run and used one million watts. And now, as you know, today in 2015, we can reach a similar performance on a mobile chip. And next year, this performance is set to double again. Are you starting to see the picture of progress now? It's all truly incredible. 
Okay, so how is this happening and how can mobile ships be moving so fast, almost worlds apart from where they were in just 2012? Well, the answer comes in two words, research money. The smartphone industry, as I've said numerous times, is huge. It's a booming market that is sustained by massive revenues coming in each quarter. All mobile chip manufacturers have a clear motive to spend large amounts of research and development money. And when colossal amounts of money is spent in research alone, what people thought was impossible four years ago becomes a reality. For some of you guys who are technologically inclined would be asking, wouldn't we be running into heat issues? Are we going to hit a brick wall in terms of how many transistors we can fit on there? And these are very good questions. As it turns out, some researchers are saying that we're only a couple of years away from getting around such issues. So assuming that we circumvent current manufacturing limits, in about five to ten years' time, we will definitely end up with phones that are as powerful as today's desktops. And just to be clear, this doesn't mean that one day everyone's just going to wake up and their PC has been replaced by a smartphone. All I'm saying is that the smartphone of the future will be as powerful as a PC today. PCs will always have specialised uses. In conclusion, the mobile industry is like nothing we've ever seen before. And because of this, we are living in a truly incredible time. I hope this video has sparked your imagination a little bit, and I trust that you learned some new information. Anyway, thanks for watching, and as usual, don't forget to share this with a friend, and subscribe if you're new, and want to see stuff. When you're seeing the evolution of the smartphone, uh, you know, when, how many of you have bag phones? Just, just as your age. Uh, 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 uh. I remember having a bag phone in my car, and if you were anywhere outside of Charlotte Metro, you couldn't talk to anybody. And even inside of Charlotte Metro, you could talk to them if you yell loud enough for somebody to hear you across the It was terrible. Now, that was, that was some time ago. But it was while I was in Charlotte, I got here in 1984. So over the past 25 years, phones have gone from being in a bag, about this big, to something you stick in your pocket with on virtual reality. This phone right here, I plug into a VR device and I'm suddenly in another my phone. I'm in virtual reality through my phone. That's how far they've come, how fast. Now, Moore's Law says Things move along in a certain rate, and it has diminished over time. It's continuing to diminish. So what we're going to see is an exponentially faster evolution as we go forward. And so you're seeing, you saw bending. Flexible screen technology is here. It's now being moved into the mainstream. It's not a theory anymore. It's not just an R&D. They're actually producing flexible screens. And they're also actually producing screens that are integrated into other things. I toured the Microsoft Future Home several years ago on Microsoft Office. You have to get an appointment, but if you get an appointment and you're up there, you can actually tour the home. And you go in, and this was several years ago, you can go in and the computer's here, right here. The computer's on the wall. Computers, piece of paper. You get information from it. You can interact with it. There is glass technology out there now that is conducive to carrying information, the full information from other sources that display it to you in multiple ways. That technology is no longer in R and D. That technology is actually in existence. So the future that we've been talking about is actually coming on as the future really is now. So next slide. years ago, I became the first Microsoft MDP in a service. When the service came out, I was, I was interested in touch technology for a while. And touch, touch technology was out there long before the service. When they first, the first service was a table. It was a big table. And I remember seeing it at Microsoft, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. I never really thought it was going to translate to something I could carry weight about a pound to do everything I needed to do to replace my laptop. So, I, so a couple of years ago, I did purchase a big Samsung touch screen. I love it. It's my desktop. And it's just a screen. There's no box. Everything is in this screen. And I, I use it all the time. 
and I don't use a mouse and keyboard very much. I use the screen. I'm touching. So when the service came out, I said, ah, this is this is great. this is wonderful. So I really embraced it. So the, the touch technology to me is really the way it's going. Because we're using phones. We're not carrying a keyboard and a mouse around with a phone. How many of you use your phone more than your computer? Be honest. <laughs> So let's look at where we're going with that thing. So touch technology, where well, we've gotten accustomed to using the phone for touch on a keyboard. How many have a slide out keyboard on your phone? Using it on the phone, touch technology. That's where all of the technology is going. Touch technology, keyboards and mice have a limited life, folks. Have a limited life. Because it's all in the room. And voice. Remember I told you about Alexa? And I walk in now, I, I've only had it for, you know, about a month. But now, I walk in and start asking questions because I've just gotten accustomed to it. Giving it commands, letting it give me information, play music, do whatever I want. And my wife is too, and my wife is anti-technology. But if somebody's anti-technology, she uses it more than I am. So the technology is going to adapt itself to you. Remember what Bill said, it's agents are going to know what you are looking for. They're going to learn what you like. They're going to learn what you need. And based on your needs, they're going to present that information to you. Maybe at the same time every day. When I come downstairs, Alexa knows what time I get downstairs because I have a routine. And when I get downstairs, sometime while I'm walking in the kitchen, she says, your schedule today is this. She knows I'm going to be down there at a certain time, and she gives me my schedule. Kind of spooky, but really useful. All right, let's take a look at where tablets are going to be in the future. Not too far in the future. Right. I work on programs and projects and 
Hong Kong, in Toronto, in Sao Paulo, in London, every day. I'm never leaving my house. I never leave my homes. I go up and sit down, and I'm connected all over the world. And I'm making decisions, and I'm organizing people, and I'm moving things, and I'm getting things done without ever leaving my office. The technology evolution has enabled me to have a job like that. That's pretty cool. So, let's take a look at what can be done with wearable technology, not just IT type, but actual, practical, making a life difference technology. I'm Sophie Morgan, an ambassador for Rex Bionics. I'm going to be explaining, as well as demonstrating, the many functions that Rex is capable of, as well as showing how easy it is to transport. Having been using Rex for over a month or so, I'm very confident transferring myself in and out unaided. I'm a level T4 complete following a car accident 10 years ago, but it's possible to use Rex with levels up to C4. To transfer, I simply open Rex's legs. I can position my chair next to Rex and transfer myself into the exoskeleton. Once I'm in and seated as far back as possible, I then fasten the straps around my shins and thighs until they're secure, but not too tight to avoid too much pressure. Also, the pads are soft and flexible and can be detached and washed. I transfer using this method, but everybody is different. It is possible to use a hoist or assistance to transfer. Once I'm ready to go, I just turn the joystick and select the stand function. By simply moving the joystick upwards, Rex then stands up. It's important to lean forward as you stand, in the same way that an able-bodied person does when standing up. There are a number of different functions that Rex can carry out. Let's start with the walking. By simply selecting walk from the list of programmed actions, I can begin to move forwards or backwards. With a walking pace reduced to a third of a typical walking speed, the stability is increased and I feel more secure and safe. We have found, and I agree, that most people certainly don't want to go any faster than this. Walking backwards is important as well because it allows me to stretch my hip flexors, which get tight over time from sitting in a wheelchair. Rex is the only exoskeleton that is capable of this function. Rex is also able to turn left and right. This can be done when stationary or on the move. This is useful for navigating smaller spaces that one might find in everyday life, such as in the office or at home. I can also raise the armrests, which leave my hands completely free for more important things, whilst being stable and balanced. It's also possible to shuffle from left to right. This is particularly useful for negotiating smaller spaces and helping stretch my hips, whilst I benefit from dynamic weight-bearing activities. There are other functions that Rex can carry out, and one of those is climbing stairs. By using a handrail, I can climb up and down stairs. Standing at the bottom of a flight of stairs for the first time in over a decade and knowing I can climb them is the most empowering feeling I can imagine. Each Rex comes with two batteries that can last for two hours of continuous walking and use no charge while stationary. The batteries are very easy to change. It only takes a few seconds. They can be fully recharged in one to two hours, so you should never be without power for Rex. Rex is also very portable. It is easily placed in a vehicle, either lying down flat in the back or with the knees bent and in the back seat. Once purchased, a consultation is given, as well as three to five days of training, to really get the most out of Rex. Okay, we've, we've seen a lot of different kinds of technologies, but the point I want to make
point here is it's not all just about virtual reality and AI. The, the kind of computer processor that goes into something like that is just as important as something that would be in an ambulance. Because it enables her, someone who's completely paralyzed and cannot walk, to be able to come there <coughs> on her own, move around in her apartment on her own. This particular device, she moved very, very slowly, but has the capability to move much more quickly than a regular walking four mile an hour pace. I've seen it in action. There are other wearable technologies that are out there. <coughs> How many of you have played the game Battle Max, where your character gets inside of an exoskeleton? Japanese have made several of them. They have one now. If you get in, it closes down, and you have a full 360 uh, graphic display. You control it either with your hands like this or with joysticks. It has weapons. They are not weapons in contemporary type. They shoot BBs or something non lethal. But it, it can run, walk, turn, pick things up very strong. And there are other exoskeleton devices that are even more powerful. Next. So, if evolution of the devices, this is an interesting one here. 1961, you see this shoe up here? It was developed by a couple of really sharp guys to help them to predict and or control the number that the ball would fall on in a roulette wheel. And it worked. And they got a lot of money by using it because you can't see it. How are you going to catch them? But they could use their foot to manipulate the roulette wheel. It worked. GoPro camera. How many of you ever used a GoPro? Several. Pretty cool. Smartwatches. 2012. Seems like they've been around a lot longer than that, doesn't it? No. Cool. The Hollow Lens, 2016. Next. Here's the history of computing hardware. There's lots of information here. I'm not going to read it all. But we've been at this for a long time. Some of us have been here have participated in it. Some of us in here have helped move it forward. So we've been at it for a while. Next slide. So here's where we came from. The first wearable computer. First PCs in 1975 and admits after 8800 followed up by the IMSA 8080. Anybody use that? Wow. <laughs> the Apple One in 76, I know several of you used that. The Apple Two in 77. The first laptop, 1981 Epson HX20 and the IBM PC, 1981. The IBM PC is in 1981's first computer, the first PC that I ever used. I was working for the U.S. government at the time as a personnel officer. At that time, there was no computer job within the government at all. So I was the computer guy and the personnel officer. So when they broke, they expected me to fix them. I had no idea what I was doing, but I had to learn. Next slide. Where we are, we've got laptops, we've got tablets, we've got desktops, desktop. We've got smartphones, and we have tablets, phone, and tablet. That's where we are. Next slide. Where are we going? Laptops, tablets, desktops, smartphones, batteries. Microsoft recently got together all the really super duper R&D guys, and they put together a video. They took the best minds they had and said, what is the world going to look like going forward? What's it going to be like? How are computers, how is technology going to integrate with our everyday normal getting work done? Let's take a look at it. Next slide. I am committed to our first party devices, including phones, Nabella. However, we need to focus our phone efforts in the near term on driving reinvention. We are moving from a strategy to grow a standalone phone business to a strategy to grow and create a vibrant Windows ecosystem that includes our first party device family. A couple of really important words he said there. 
ecosystem, first party device. Ecosystem being the entire system of technology and how it interfaces to that first party device. What you are using right now, in the moment, to accomplish something. Satya Nadella, this year, a very short time ago. Next slide. Now, let's take a look at what the future, according to Microsoft, is going to look like.
when I started this group almost 20 years ago, uh, one of my main goals was to try to bring the technology information to you in the best form that we could so that we could help better prepare you for the evolution that technology was moving in, that we knew it was going to go. So over the last 20 years, we brought to you the best presenters we could, the best information we could, and tried to help you prepare yourself for the future that's always been unfolding on us. I hope we've accomplished that. We've tried very hard to do that. And I hope you enjoy this presentation. It was just an embracing of where we are, where we've been, and where we're going. And I hope that it's excited you as much as it has me. Thank you for letting me present to you.